video. I'm going to try and share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. yes, indeed. Great. Trying to get it on the slideshow. There we go. Okay, you're probably one of the biggest groups I've ever spoken to live or virtually. So I really have to commend you on having you all set up and uh, it's great that you're all here. So as Billy said, my name is Roz Palmer. I'm the Community Education and Volunteer Manager with Community Law and Mediation. And the first thing I do have to say is I am not legal, so I won't be able to answer any legal questions. But I'm just going to uh, talk about our service this morning and I'll be able to point you in the right direction if you need any legal advice. So just a little bit about so actually we celebrated 45 years this year. We're actually based in Kulak out in the north side of Dublin. Um, so in 1975 we were called, we've had a few names, uh, Kulak Community Law Centre, then we were north side Community Law Centre, then we were north side Community Law Centre Mediation Centre and now we are Community Law and Mediation. And the reason we took Northside out was because we're pretty much now a national organization. So I said, so we opened our first um, office outside Dublin in 2014. So we have a, an office now in Limerick <clears throat> and we work out of the sort of the disadvantaged areas like South Hill, Moiros, um, so more of the regen areas is where we work. We are a charity. We are funded our core funding comes from the Department of Social Protection, which is probably called something else now, but they change it so often I can't keep up. And then we would get um, other monies, like we, we fundraise a little bit, but we're not great on that. But we would get the Bar Council are very good to us, the Law Society, place like that. We don't have a catchment area anymore, as I said. So especially at the moment, because of the work we're doing and we're all remote, we're actually... Um, we're, we're a lot more accessible I'll talk through that. So our main services are free legal services. We have a free mediation service and communi community education. So I'm gonna go through the three of them. My main responsibilities are, I manage the mediation service and the community education section. And also that encompasses uh, our volunteers. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. After each section, I'll, I'll stop and see if anybody has questions. Um, so if you just put them in the chat. So I'll talk about our legal services first. So we do advocacy and we do represent people in court, um, but in, only in these following areas. So we would in debt, housing, community care, employment and equality, social welfare and environmental justice, which we just launched this year. So that's a new area of law for us. You might have heard our CEO, she's actually, we're getting a lot of traction on that, like she's been talking on drive time and things like that to try and explain to people the work we're going to be doing. I don't have our um, stats yet for 2020, but I think they're going to pretty much be doubled, um, which it'd be interesting to see. But in 2019, and most years we, we help over 3,000 people within all our services. Okay. So what are legal services? So I suppose this is all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our, our pre-COVID, I suppose. So normally what would have happened was we're all working remotely now. Um, we would have had a clinic every Thursday evening, which was open to anybody to attend. It was a first come first basis. We don't take appointments for this clinic. and It's usually we see about 25 to 30 people on an evening. We're very lucky we have uh, 25 volunteer barristers that would um, volunteer with us and they would advise at those clinics together with our own solicitors. I'm sure you've heard of FLAC. So normally there's FLAC clinics around the country that, that would do the same sort of service as we do, but obviously they weren't, they're not in Coolock or on the north side of Dublin or that side of Dublin, because we would, we would cover that area. And in Limerick, we used to, run our outreach clinics in, in different organizations around Moy Ross and South Hill. But since COVID came in, we are now running our clinics over the phone. 
and these are all appointment based. So we run them all day Tuesday and all day Thursday in Dublin. And then in Limerick, we run them all day uh, Tuesday mornings and Wednesday mornings, and they're all appointment based. We don't do waiting lists and most people um, get, get an appointment straight away. We're actually not too bad at the moment. When COVID hit, we were out the door because a lot of, we actually, we actually got up and running very quickly. Um, it pushed us into the 21st century in relation to Zoom and looking at different ways of being able to, I suppose, provide our services. They are open to, the clinics are open to anyone who needs legal advice. And also, even though we, we represent and do advocacy work in relation to certain areas of law, but at our clinics, we would advise on everything, anything and every, everything, just to let you know. Um, okay, is there any questions about our legal services before I move on? If you want to talk to it, you have to tap the unmute button. If anybody wants to, to join in, please just unmute yeah. yourself and, uh, and fire away to Taraz. She's happy to take any questions or queries people might just, have. Yeah. If I can I'm just can I come in, Billy? Yes, Eileen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I noticed um, that you said at the beginning you personally have no legal background, yeah. but I'm just wondering with um, older people, we're trying, we're advocating for the commencement of the assistant decision making legislation, and that is becoming a big issue now. Are you advocating on behalf of uh, on that as well? Exactly. Yes, we are. Um, also, a lot of the other work, which I didn't really get into, like we do an awful lot of policy work and law reform work. And yes, we have put submissions into that. And actually, we have a case going on in the courts at the moment that if that act was enacted, we wouldn't be in court. So we work very, yes, we're very much um, involved in that. There was a question, Ross, came in there about is there an income threshold for people um, approaching no. you for your service? No, like I suppose, which I, I have put in somewhere, like we do try to reach to the people, the vulnerable people who, who can't afford our, our services. But in saying that, we don't we don't do um, there's no means test for any of our services. Okay. Uh, we, I, I've just been reading a lot of stuff in the in the papers and the media recently, uh, particularly I suppose since lockdown, where people are finding themselves in um, particular difficulties in relation to maybe dealing with um, the contacts that they have, um, because they're relying maybe on people to do shopping for them, to manage some of their money, um, and the the I suppose the 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 possibility is there for exploitation of people. Is, is that so, if somebody should kind of find themselves in that circumstance, in those circumstances, is that something that your centre could advise or help people on? Absolutely, like there's nothing, um, I suppose, actually I had that experience ourselves in our family in relation to, um, somebody exploiting my aunt who was in nursing or she had, had home help and we were looking after her it's a different like really that's a criminal act you know so mm -hmm. it depends so they probably would be advised to advise or, you know if they feel that they're because a lot of it is under because that new law that came in there last year the year before uh, and the word i can never say the co coercion it could come under that you know what i mean and mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. I look. To be honest, I would always encourage people if you feel you're in to absolutely give us a call, and we will always put you in. You know, you will get some advice. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank Can you. I ask a um, question? How do we get in touch with you? I'm going to give you the number at the end. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Can I come in there and ask a question, Dominic, please? Yes, Dennis. Um, I'm just wondering. You have a clinic in. Uh, South Hill and my Ross. Yeah. I have a little bit of a problem there at times because I think I acknowledge all the help the disadvantaged areas need and get. But unfortunately, I think they get at times far too much, not too much, but other parts of Limerick. Oh, I agree. And let down. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree. Unfortunately, it's all to do with funding. Yes, I, I understand that. Yeah. With that one, um, 
office in Limerick rather than two, because there are other areas. So there's poverty in all areas, basically, oh, no, we, you know, a certain amount. Oh, I know. I would love to be. Um, absolutely. We would love to be nationwide. Well, sometimes I'd love to be nationwide and sometimes I wouldn't for the amount of work. Like, we're a very small team. But that doesn't mean you have to breathe from those areas to to access that, you know, that to access that the, the help. Like, it's open to anybody, but it's just, unfortunately... Unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. A lot of people would feel out of the way going. Sure, sure, going, I understand. They're out of the way, you know, and people have never actually going in. So I think that's... Well, all. you see... You're right, and actually, that's why our phone clinics move away from the screen. Our phone clinics are 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 it's it, people. It's, they're more accessible to people, and I think moving forward, once this, I suppose, pandemic is over, we will look to be doing both. We'll keep our phone clinics and also our face to face clinics, so we are still more accessible to people. Okay, thank you. But unfortunately, I think maybe just in, in relation to, to Dennis's question there, I think that one of the things that we have found certainly within Age Action is that one of the if the, if there can be any upside or advantages to the fact that that um, people are now using technology is that geography really doesn't come into play anymore. Whereas you know we would have had inquiries from people in various parts of the country about joining our youth network in those places, but now through this. Um, format this morning you know it doesn't matter where somebody is um and I'm, i don't know exactly that what we have something like there's nearly 60 participants on this call i'm sure they're from from all over the country and i know from before christmas we had people from outside ireland join us on some of our chats as well so that's one of the good things if you like i suppose we're no longer limited by the space that we have offices in yeah. yes Hopefully exactly. and also i suppose we are anxious to get back to face to face because we do feel that the most disadvantaged or most vulnerable persons aren't accessing our services, you know, so I think the two together will complement our service and we will be able to access more people and um, because we we fight for funding all the time we're very badly funded so we would love to be able to um, have offices everywhere like the, our Limerick office is the only uh, law centre outside that actually has an office outside of Dublin. There's a few other law centres around the, uh, the, in Dublin, but they'd be more specific in the sense of like there's Mercy Law Centre and they would just deal with housing. There's also a, a law centre, Ballymun Law Centre, but they are <laughs> very much catchment bound. They can't go outside their catchment. So unfortunately, sometimes you're restricted by your funding as well. Um, and also the resources, like we have 15 staff, but the majority of them are part time. Um, so, you know, we it's just we fight all the time for funding because <laughs> the, the government mm -hmm. is, 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 is a tough one. <laughs> anyway, we're still here after 45 years, so we're going nowhere. That's good. Yeah. And I maybe at this stage, maybe just throw in a question. Uh, sure or a question or two. So I'm going to launch the polling button here and um, see you should on your screen. It should, uh, I hope it has come up. Yeah, you should be able to see a series of questions and they're simple yes or no answer. Well, sorry, the first one is at first, the second one isn't. But uh, maybe if you just have a look at question one there, if you can see it, and um, you should be able to, to answer. <laughs> All I will get is a figure for the number of people who are answered it. So your name or your details don't come up in the answers to these questions, just in case anybody is concerned about uh, privacy and data sharing. Uh, these are totally anonymous. So just give a couple of minutes um, for, for that. I suppose the first one there is just a simple question because we did say we would talk about wills and power of attorney and that's as part of the, the discussion this morning. Have you made a will? You know, it's a simple yes or, or no answer. I'm sure, I hope you can all see these uh, depending I suppose on the mm -hmm. device you have, um, it should be able to, to show up. And the question I suppose again is, you know, when did you last, when did you make your will or when was the last time you maybe thought about looking at it and, uh, and revising it? Um, and these questions, oh, thank you, sorry, Elsa has just come up to say, if you say no to the first question, you can't submit the questionnaire. 
Has anybody else found that? I yeah. think it's probably yeah. asking you. Well, I suppose they don't. If you've said no, I think the rest of them probably don't. Um, I maybe don't come into effect. Okay, so yeah. that, thank you for bringing that to, our, to you my attention. Because I did say yes on one, and it's still not allowing me to submit. Mm. So okay. Since, yeah. Right, we may have to redo no. this. Okay, but anyway, but it, it'll just give us a, a, a flavour. Yeah. It's the, as I say, the joys of, of learning how to use this technology as, as we go along. Billy, can I just mention? Yes, um, Gary. Uh, Jerry, sorry, yes. Gary. Yeah, sorry. Um, I've discovered that uh, it will only submit if you answer all questions. Ah, okay. Right. So, okay. That's the answer then. So, yeah. But that's not right. No. No. Uh, no, I, no? I, I, oh. I, I, have, I have answered uh, the three questions. But I it can't submit. It, it, there are it more than three. Submit. There's actually, John, there's actually there's seven questions in total. So if you scroll down, maybe that might be it. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Oh. Sorry, that's... So yeah, you can probably just see the first, I can just yeah, see the first three. Right. Yeah, yeah, but if you yeah. scroll down, there's actually, sorry, I should have explained that at the beginning, there's seven in total, so. Oh yeah. So hopefully that's uh, Jerry, um, is, is, that gets us over that. So almost half of you have, have filled in questions or answered questions at this stage. It's not, you don't have to answer the question, but uh, it just gives us, I suppose, an idea of um, uh, maybe poses some questions for us, because I think it doesn't matter what, um, it doesn't matter what age we are. Um, and this is certainly not uh, aimed at people of, of a particular age or, or older people in general, but I think it's important for all of us to have, um, I suppose, thought about what it is we would like to happen um, to our, I suppose, our, 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 our homes, our, our, um, our memorabilia, the pieces, the stuff that means something to us and would we like to pass them on to people um, at a later stage. The old phrase of you don't know when you walk out the door that you might be hit by a bus uh, yes. comes to mind. But these days, I suppose buses are few and far between and we probably shouldn't be using buses anyway. So I'll just give that another minute. And, uh... and also another um, important question mm -hmm. is, um, do you know where your will is? Actually, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the power of attorney is very important. I've made a will, but I actually hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. And if you live on your own, I think that's a really important thing to organize as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't think of it when I was making the will. <laughs> you can still do it. It's funny, it doesn't- Oh yes, I'm going to. It doesn't, so. um, like in America, it's part of your will, but they don't seem to make it here you know, or give you the option to do it for some reason. Yeah. I remember a number of years ago getting a letter from a solicitor in uh, to my home address to discover that um, my mother had gone to him to uh, push a, a power of attorney piece added, in, added into her will. And it was myself and my sister that she had nominated. And uh, she never told us that she had gone to the solicitor <laughs> and that it needed our approval, obviously, to, to accept it. And uh, so I rang my sister and said, is there something going on that I don't know about? What's, what's happening? So I suppose it is important also. And it's, it's something we will follow up maybe in next week's discussion too. Mm. Um, that whole thing of thinking ahead. Um, you know, it's important that if we're putting somebody or adding somebody as an executor or as a, or for, a power, for giving, granting the power of attorney, that, that we make them aware at some stage that that is a possibility, you know, that it may happen. Eddie, can stage. I come in there if you don't mind? Yes, indeed. I just have two things to put you here. Um, first of all, the power of attorney, I think it can be very expensive. But secondly, you mentioned there, I think ahead for next week. Mm -hmm. I promoted that book here in Limerick but to another club. And I found a great, my own wife passed away there, uh, her first anniversary just a couple of days ago. And I, I had that set up, we set it up for my wife and myself. Mm -hmm. And I brought that out to the hospice with me and gave it into the hospice about a number of weeks before she passed. And later on, when she was, she was because I, the problem is, if you are very sick and, and dying, it is their duty is, is the doctor's duty to keep you alive, basically. 
and so they'll fill you with antibiotics and everything else. But totally <laughs> the doctor it came over to me and says, I have I've acknowledged um, her will and I, I, I and I will abide by it on, on the Think Ahead book. So it's very, very important. And I'm going to be, I'm trying to promote, I, I expect to, be, to promote here in Limerick as well to our own new 3A group. So that's, I, 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 I would ask everyone to turn up for the next session. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to end the polling here and hand you back to Ross. Ross sorry, Ross, we kind of got sidetracked no, a little fine. bit there. But uh, we'll come back to you. I'll just share the results actually with you there, just yeah. to, so you can have a quick look at, at the answers that people gave. So you can see there that uh, for a lot of people, it's been over two years maybe since they actually made their will. And as you can see, while circumstances may not have changed for the majority, it is something I suppose that we should maybe continuously look at and, and, and keep in mind to, to check on every so often, you know. So hopefully that was just that's just giving us some background and some flavour, and it will allow us hopefully then to, to take those questions and maybe address them at a future session also. Okay, thanks, Ross. Sorry, back to you. No problem. Okay. So next, I'm going to talk about our mediation service. Um, so what is it? So it's a free dispute resolution service. We set it up in 2004. Um, our biggest areas, and I'll talk a little bit more about these, are community and family mediation. So they're the two largest areas that people would come with issues for in relation to mediation. Again, this is a free service. So what is mediation? It's very important to know that it's a voluntary process by which parties in a dispute mutually agree to meet. That's really important because there's no point in dragging somebody to mediation who doesn't want to be there because it won't work. Um, to meet with a professional impartial, which is very important, mediator who facilitates the parties to explore ways in which their dispute might be resolved and work together to determine an outcome. Mm -hmm. So that's really important in the sense of um, just in relation to, we would work in the courts So some of our mediators who are all volunteers. Um, I have 56 mediators who, who mediate with us. And since COVID, we're up and running by Zoom. Um, and it's actually working really well. But we would work in the courts. Normally, um, we would work in the district court. One of our mediators would sit in the courts um, and the judge, if there's a case that he thinks that uh, really should be mediation and not be in the courts, he will refer them in to us. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't because obviously the person is ready to go in court and wants their day in court, so sometimes that doesn't work. That's why we try to explain to the judge as well, because if, if the judge tells you to do something, a lot of the time you obviously will do it, um, but it doesn't mean you want to do it. So we always have to explain to the judges that it has to be voluntary. If they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. Okay. So just in relation to what the role of the mediator is, because a lot of people think when they come to mediation, the mediator <clears throat> is going to help you make decisions, give you some um, I suppose some, some advice, but no, they don't. They're completely impartial. It's really a safe space for people who are in conflict to come together and talk freely about the issue. <clears throat> so they facilitate this. We work on a co-mediation, which means that there's always two mediators in the room. So, um, and, and yeah, that's the way we've always worked. Some of the benefits to it, it's very flexible, especially at the moment, because we're more accessible again, because you can do it from your room, you know, your house, you don't have to leave your house. Sometimes there's a bit of an issue if it's a separating couples and the two people are still living in the home, but Sorry, I think I was muted there. Um, Okay. That was my fault. Sorry, there was some background noise. So I muted everybody. So apologies. Yeah, sorry. No, sorry, continue. No, it came up to me. Oh, no, you're okay. So also it keeps you out of court. Court is very expensive. I'm not sure how many people have had to, to go through the court process, but it's very expensive and also it's very stressful. So really now there's a big emphasis on mediation and well, it could be bigger, but um. The, a new mediation act came in there about three years ago 
So a solicitor, if they feel that you should get mediation, they have to say it to you that you should try mediation. But again, it's up to you. It's a lot quicker. Some of your results. So I suppose a, a mediation sessions, you, if you come for mediation, you, you could be done after three sessions and it could work. And it really helps rebuild relationships because it's a, a space where people can listen to themselves. Sometimes it mightn't work um, and you, you have to go through the court process, but that's, you know, but at least you've tried. And again, as I said, our mediation service is free. There is a family mediation, just so a national uh, uh, part of the Legal Aid Board, there is a family mediation service, but we do all mediations. So what else do we offer? So today is pretty much like a mediation awareness talk to let people know um, that this, this is here. And as I said, again, there's no catchment. We're open to anybody in the country. Um, and we also get referrals from guards, from um, social workers, different organizations. Um, so we're widely known. Also, I suppose, with these talks, I, we try to, I suppose, empower the community that, you know, there is help out there. We also have another service called Conflict Coaching, which I'll explain in a second. So Conflict Coaching, sometimes when two people come together to do mediation, um, one person isn't ready. There might be, you know, obviously the reason they're there is something has broken down their communication whatever and sometimes the other person might be a bit stronger and able to i suppose articulate themselves better so when everybody comes to our mediation service they are offered both parties it's always everybody's offered the same thing offered co conflict coaching so this is a so all our all our um, mediators and all our conflict coaches are trained and can't and keep up their training because they have to continually train as well and we will help them with that so they're very they're very experienced mediators so this is one where it's just you and the conflict coacher so it's a one-to-one -one, and they help them to i suppose how to manage interpersonal conflict so that's a really helpful um and and a lot of people don't take it up but it's it's, it's a very good service but just in relation to the types of mediation, because they're all sort of, there is, so, so for example, community mediation. This one works a little bit different in the sense of, um, well, for example, it could be a neighbor dispute. Somebody's dog is barking all the time and it's driving you nuts and the communication has broken down. So this mediation in relation to the other mediate types of mediation is actually the mediators would go and knock on your, on your um, neighbor's door and see if they want to participate. So we would contact. So if somebody contacts us for mediation, we call them party one and party two. So party one contacts us for mediation. We have to get the details of that person. And then they give us the details of the person they want to do mediation with. When GDPR came in, there was a big uproar how we we're going to do this. But once you can explain why you're doing something like this, um, and it was thrown on our faces from say party two if they didn't want to do the mediation but it's the only way we can do it so we would contact the second the other party by sending them a letter and then following up if we don't hear from them we follow up with a phone call and explain the situation and that's how it works the neighbors with beauty as i said is a little bit different is we would party one would uh, contact us they would go out the mediators would go out and meet them and then they go and, and knock on the door of the um the neighbor to see if they want to try and sort this out it's a very effective way actually sometimes it just takes one or two sessions it's just you know they the other party didn't realize that the dog was barking and is annoying the hell out of them so so it's it, it's a very strong type of mediation there's another one called parental mediation so this time this one is more so around separating couples so be again the communication is broken down there's children involved so we would help them come together make a plan in relation to access maintenance put budgets together um, and that would be the highest type of the most uh, mediation that would come into us another one which is very much um happened over the last couple of years is it, it, it's it's getting higher so grandparents visitation mediation so sometimes when the separating couples Unfortunately, they use the children against each other and sometimes won't let the grandparents see their kids. 
their their grandchildren. And that one, um, again, it, it, we will bring the all the parties together and um, try and sort it out. Elder mediation. So this would involve a lot of the time, sometimes a lot of the time, the older person. So it could be around, you know, um, the older person is coming to a stage where, well, the parent, the, say the sibling think that they need to have somebody in the house with the, their, 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 their father or mother or something like that. And the older person's like, no, I'm fine. But it's actually causing a big conflict. So again, bringing them all together, then they listen to the older person, see what actually they want. So that one is, yeah, we would do a lot of that. Then there's sibling conflict. <clears throat> So this could be again over there. The, I suppose the parent maybe does need extra help, but they're now gone past being able to, I suppose, articulate what they want. But there's a couple of kids involved and they all have different ideas of what the care of that parent should be. Or over the a, will, a dispute over will. That happens a lot of the time if it breaks and or not having a will it can uh, cause a lot of problems in families. And then finally, we would do some workplace mediation. So these are staff disputes. Now we would only do them for charities or small charities or community and voluntary um, organizations. We wouldn't do it for big organizations or uh, anyone who is, you know, we know that they can pay for it. So very small. We wouldn't get a huge amount of that, but um, it, again, it's very effective. No. So if you have any questions on the mediation. No, will I keep going? Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit then about our community education service. So the types of courses that we would run, um, so we would make tailor made courses for community and public uh, organizations, but we would charge for these. So we would, for example, we would be the main trainers in debt for the money advice and budgeting service. So they would have a training budget. So we, I would tender for that each year. And also it's a source of income for us. We'd also run our own one day legal courses. And they would be there would be cause for that as well. The majority of people coming on them would be advocates or information officers who work providers who work with the likes of CICs. We do a lot of work for citizens information. And then we would do um, free know your rights courses for members of the public or community and voluntary organisations. So I'll talk a little bit more about that for yourself. So last year or in 2019, I don't have my um, stats for last year yet. As I said, so we would always, between all the services in relation to the education, we would have reached over 700 participants. Um, and then we run, I run a program in schools in legally, it's called the Legal Eagles program. So I run it in two of the local schools in, um, in Kulak. And that's really to break down the barriers for legal um, in relation to people accessing legal services. And that's trying to let, make them understand that the law is there for all, for everybody. Um, and and it's a very interesting program and it's, it's actually a lovely program to, to do at the moment. Obviously they're not in school, they should be running it at the minute. So we hope to try and get that up and running um, soon. So just around the, the, the types of talks that we deliver for the likes of yourselves, if you're interested. Um, so the importance of making a will, which we spoke about, We'd love to be able to deliver that for you. And during power of attorney, as we spoke about, some of these might not be um, relevant. Family law, again, if you, you know, in relation to access, if you're having problems in relation to accessing um, or seeing your grandparent or your grandchildren or anything like that. Consumer law, I know Billy mentioned that in relation to like insurance, once you get over a certain age, you either can't get it or it's extortionate price. So we can talk to you about your rights around that if anyone's interested in employment rights or housing rights. So they're the main because they're the main areas, as I said, that we would sort of um, work in. But all of those as well. Um, I know somebody asked I'll give you the number in a minute um, and you can get legal advice if, if you're having any personal issues in relation to that. 
So I spoke about our volunteers. We're very lucky. We have 20 barristers um, actually who are now working on our phone clinics. They also do, we, all the barristers take the cases uh, pro bono. As I said, we have 56 mediator who volunteer with us. We're very lucky. We have senior counsels who work on cases for free for us. At the moment, I have about six to seven legal interns. So they are seconded either from um, the likes of say, big firms like Arthur Cox are very good to us, or a lot of the people who are studying law now, there's as part of their, their degree, they have to do college placements and we would facilitate that as well. So, so, we're, so we nearly have about, oh, at any time we could nearly have, I'd be working with over a hundred volunteers at a time. So that's the contact details. So that number, even if you're bringing from wherever you're ringing in the country, um, you, you can use that number and you'll get through to us. Also, we have on our website, if you want to have a look at, we have some podcasts and a bit of information there if, um, yeah, if you need. So I think that's me. If anybody has any more questions, I'm very much happy to answer them. Thanks, um, Roz. Um, I suppose that gives us a flavour of the type of work that, that you're doing um, um, in community law and mediation. And I know when we were setting this up that one of the things we talked about specifically was around wills and, and the ensuring power of attorney. And thank you for the information you've fed us through those polls. What we will do from that is take that and, uh, and working with Ross, hopefully come back to you with a specific seminar, maybe based on that, if that's something that you would be interested in. Um, I'm just, some people have hands raised, so let me just take uh, questions there. Colm, you have a hand raised there. Do you want to, to go ahead? If you could just unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my question was, it was in relation to wills. Is that okay? In relation to wills? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I wanted to set up a, um, a trust fund for my daughter. She's autistic and um, is there anything I should know about, about that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it's with the solicitor, but it's, it's going on for so long now that... that, that um, well, that's, you see, if we did the talk for you on wills, you could ask that question. I wouldn't be able to answer that question for you. Sorry, is that, is it, if you did a talk on wills, is that what you're saying? If, we, if, we, if, you, if you would like us to, to deliver a talk on wills, I, I get a barrister or a solicitor to deliver that talk for you. That's where you could ask that question. I wouldn't yeah. be able to answer that question for you. Very good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Ross, if Colm um, contacts the number of the uh, of your your number there, can he be put in touch with somebody who maybe gives us give him some advice on that? Is that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay. okay. And Thank you. I see there we have a question from. I just see J E have the hand oh, raised. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, no, no, my question was just about uh, confidentiality. Oh, that's, yeah, absolutely. Well, well it's just, it just, seems, it, just, it just seems, you know, if you've uh, a lot of volunteers, legal students, also transition year students, and a lot of the information could be very sensitive. Uh, all our information, you're right, all our, most of our information is very sensitive. The legal interns do a lot of research for us. They wouldn't have access to clients' information, um, but obviously the barristers would because they have to. They're delivering the service for us. We all work. It's, it's the height of confidentiality, and you know they have to sign documents, things like that. I know that you know doesn't mean anything, but um, absolutely, like we're all bound by confidentiality in the work we do. Um. Can I ask the question? Yes, um, Francis, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Bill. Can I ask you, um, Ros, what is the difference between power of attorney and, and power of, I think, is it enduring? <laughs> you can. I can't, I'm not going to answer that question because I could give you the wrong answer because I'm not legal. So again, if we, if we put the talk for you, um, like, I, even if I know the answer to these questions, I'm not legal and I can't answer the question for you. Okay. All right. Fire. I, am, am I correct? In, that there is a difference, I think, isn't there? I, I can't answer the question. Well, really you can't sorry. answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. 
I would okay. say, Francis, maybe one of the places that I'm certainly I go for information on this are answers to questions like citizens that. Citizens' information. The citizen, I was just going to say thanks, Ross. Yeah. The citizens' information website. It's amazing. Um, yeah. They will give you a lot of the answers to just to, to that particular question. Certainly, they'll, they'll they'll provide you with information. And one of the things I suppose again, I know Ross and myself talked about this before we we set this up today. The citizens' information service around the country is fantastic, and um, certainly anybody that requires further information, have a look at their website. If you don't find it on their website, they have phone numbers for their various offices, and they're more than happy to to help in in, in that area. Good. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry now. I will, I, unfortunately, anything, I can't give you legal advice in any sort of way. No, no, that's, okay. that's okay. Thank you. Would I say something, please? Yes, sure. indeed. Um, I'm very interested in the enduring power of attorney, but I'm having an awful lot of difficulty. I'm trying to get it done. But of course, I can't go in to see the solicitor and I can't go and visit my doctor to say that I'm okay. So I'd love much more, I'd love a talk on enduring power of attorney. Great. Yeah. And actually that's a really good point because the more information like I have in relation to like your questions even beforehand, that's brilliant. Um, so if you have, if we do set up the talks and you have questions like that even beforehand, because um, you know, that that's really helpful for us so we can really yeah. tailor make talk for yourself yeah it's very frustrating i'm dying to get going on it all I as long know. as i, I think... don't conk out in the meantime <laughs> 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 well, hopefully not. But in the, if you do have, if, if there are specific questions, like Ross says, that you maybe want yeah. to ad have addressed, um, you maybe just use the email address events at ageaction.ie. Yes. Pop on an email to us and then we can pass them to Ross and make sure that the talk is Thanks tailored to the questions you want. Yep. Mm -hmm. you. Can I Great. just ask you know, the, 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 the cost, which comes into everything, I suppose, the cost of um, power of attorney, I believe it's quite expensive. I have my own will made up, but I'll not the power of attorney, so, and I'm thinking seriously of doing that. So can, do you have any, any idea of the cost of setting yes. up the power of attorney? We are, we're asked that question all the time in relation to different legal services. We have no clue because our, our services are free. So we, we just say to people, ring around. Well, can I just say something here? Can I, hello, this is Beatrice. Can I just say something here? I've had in power of attorney yes, drawn up by my solicitor about six or seven years ago, and it was extremely expensive. I was actually horrified when I got the bill. My, my situation is rather unusual. My husband is in a nursing home, very bad Alzheimer's, and um, I had to make a power of attorney. And what I'd like to ask the next meeting is, the difference, as the previous lady said, between the power of attorney and the enduring power of attorney, because I found that that every time I went to the doctor with my husband, I knew he was failing. He couldn't manage his finances or anything, but she was very reluctant to give me the go ahead for me to take over all the financial affairs as if she was holding on to his individual status. And it's only a doctor that can actually draw the fine line between when we release everything and everything goes over to you. And maybe something like this would be interesting too to speak about at the next meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I Thanks. come in here, Catherine yes, here? Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, I have just in the past month or two, well, this is to the first speaker there with the numbers on her name. Um, I've just made an enduring power of attorney within the past month or two. And I was able to both see my solicitor and go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And my doctor, and uh, it and my solicitor gave me some information to give to the doctor where there has been a very recent directive out to doctors about filling in the form. Okay. And certainly what Beatrice is saying, um, you know, couldn't happen now. The form is very specific. Doctors are brought into courts. It's not an easy form. Um, and But she filled it out. There is a fee for that. And I can't really uh, answer Dennis's question about how expensive it is, but slightly my understanding of it is that there, there would be two fees. There's the first fee with the solicitor for just doing it. But I think, uh, and this again is, well, I must ask my solicitor, um, it's not until it gets lodged in court that the big fee is. 
Oh. Um, I'll know now in a week or two, like what my bit and the two attorneys have to sign it, have to be there. And then I have two notice parties who are my two children. So um, it is very doable. Um, you know, you, you do need people who do attorney for you and um, no, it's do, do it, but a yeah, talk on it would be good. Yeah. Yes, I think so to clarify. And Thanks for that information. Thank you. Yeah. And that's right there is a there is a fee when it's actually if if it's actually enacted an additional yes. fee yes, that the is. whoever you know the is taking over the power of attorney they they yes. have to take care of that yeah yeah the enactment yes mm -hmm. can i just ask a question Sorry, no, yes. mm -hmm. um ros with regards you were talking about the mediation that you do yeah um do you find that the majority of cases, I don't know if you've got any figures, are the majority of cases that, that go into mediation, do they find some sort of um, yeah. you know, finality? Do they get a solution? Yeah. A lot of what happens is um, a lot of the time, like after each session, agreement is, is put up because sometimes they have homework to do as such as we might call it. Mm. Um, and then you usually go off for two weeks and see how it goes and comes back. And then they also, they have a final agreement of how they're going to work things out, you know, um, and on all types of mediations, not the community one with the neighbours, but the rest of them, yes. Because some people want to put that, you, they can go to the solicitors or go into court with it as well and make it a legal document. We don't do that, but they can. So yeah, there is. Now, it, it's, so we would take on, we would get about 300 queries a year and really about 100, 120 of them would go to case. The main reason for them not going to case would be the other party doesn't want to do it. Also, just in relation to mediation, <clears throat> we don't do, they do in the family mediation service. When somebody is separating, we don't do the, fi the full financials in the sense of splitting up the assets like house or pensions or things like that. We don't do that. So sometimes that's the reason it doesn't go ahead as well. But if there's a big waiting list in the family mediation service with the legal aid board, we don't have one. And um, so if there's children involved, we might do that part for them. And then they go to the legal aid board to do the full financial. So look, yeah, there's always a piece of paper to agree and everybody gets everything, you know, same. Um, and it's for bottom of what's been agreed. So it's agreed at the end of the session. It's sent to us and we put it into a proper document for them and it's sent out to both parties mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, yeah, but I suppose it is probably, it's probably just good to have somebody objective involved in, um, in some of these you Yeah, know, and it's a safe space and you've equal time yeah. to speak. It's all about equality. And, you know, so when you come to a mediation session, uh, session at the first session you have a private mediation so each party would meet privately with this and then you go into this, just to listen to both sides because obviously sometimes if they're coming from different places and then you go into the full meeting and it's up to the parties how they want to they might say some things in the in the private meetings that they may never say in the full meeting but that's never brought up because it's completely confidential um, but yeah, it's quite successful in the sense of sometimes it's small things that now they'll actually text each other or they will can have a phone call. It can be that simple, but it makes a big difference when there's children involved. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm conscious that it's uh, it's coming up to, to 25 past mm -hmm. 11. Sorry, Lydia, had you uh, your hand raised there? Sorry, you're on mute there. So Yeah, um, just with regard to will making, uh, I I suspect that I like quite a lot of the people who are listening possibly have an international dimension in that they may have children who've emigrated, they may have half their assets in another country because they've moved here. So when we have the talk on wills and enduring power of attorney, I think it would be very helpful if they could touch a bit on what happens if you know your family. Uh, or beneficiaries are not uh, in Ireland. Uh, thanks. That's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And I know we've had we've had some queries there just uh, in the chat as well, which some of you may have seen in relation to capital gains tax and also how the laws on probate have changed in recent times. Um, so again, those are the, those are issues. We'll, I'll discuss those with, with Roz and we'll come back with the date for you um, where we can actually address a lot of the questions you have. And as I said, if you have other questions that you would like us to, to follow up on, please just let us drop us a line to events at ageaction.ie and, um, and we'll put those into the mix and, and hopefully deal with those specific areas then at a, in the next in the next few weeks we'll, we'll sort a date out uh, just to i suppose first of all i suppose say thank you all for joining this morning we had at one stage we had 61 people on the call wow. which is one of the biggest groups we've had so far so i hope it was of interest to you thank you for joining us next week as i said annette is going to be leading our group next week um, on my behalf so you'll be listening to her rather than me and uh, she is going to introduce rebecca lloyd from the irish hospice foundation who will talk to us about their think ahead program which dennis has mentioned earlier on as well and yeah. in the email that's that we sent out to you and um, there is a link to actually have a look at the think ahead forum rebecca was asking that maybe if people did have a chance between now and then to take a look for that at that forum and just have an idea of what's contained in it and it may raise some questions or issues that we can discuss then next week yeah. so in the meantime just to say thank you to roz and to the community law and mediation center in kulak Roz, thank you it was much appreciated giving us your time this morning you've obviously raised lots of questions for us and, um, and we will come back and follow up on those. And lastly, just to remind you that the Film Club takes place on yeah. Friday afternoon. That's at quarter to three. And as I said, the film this Friday is Passport to Pimlico. It's a tongue, tongue twister. And uh, you're more than welcome to join on that. Um, if you have difficulty in checking out the web link, just drop us an email and we'll send you on that again. And um, just, uh, I suppose that, that's it, unless anybody has any final comments that they wish to add. You know, just say, um, I'm sorry to come in again, I don't mean to. Uh, no problem. I'm Rebecca Lloyd. Um, yeah, I spoke to Rebecca a number of occasions. Um, the Think Ahead book, it's been very well thought out um, by the Irish Hospice Foundation. There is nothing in that that it, that it covers absolutely everything, legal advice, your everything you could think about death, anything got to do with it. It's all in there. So what I would advise everyone to turn up for that meeting. That's all. Okay. And I, I should say, actually, Janice, thank you for that. And um, that, um, you know, please, um, we have, as I said, well, we dropped to 51 of this stage. People are moving on to do other things. But feel free to spread the word to your friends. If there's anybody you think that would be interested, the email that we sent you on, uh, it's not limited to anybody. You're more than, we're, we're only limited by the number of people that we can have on the call, which is 100. And we've yet to reach that. So maybe that's our target. We want to reach that at some stage. Um, and this talk has been recorded. Um, and it will be available on our YouTube channel later if you wish to pass it on to anybody else or have a look at it yourself. So that's it then. So thank Great. you very Thanks much indeed. Everybody. Thanks, Roz, again. And we look forward thank to seeing some much. of you on Friday and the rest Thanks, of you maybe Rose. next Wednesday. So. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Lily. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Many thanks. Many thanks. Good.